Hello from the Center for Livable Cities and a warm welcome to the ninth episode of our CLC webinar series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. I'm your host, Dinesh Naidu. Our distinguished speaker today is the World Bank's Martin Van Nieuwkoop, and he will be speaking on seeding a food secure future. But first, some housekeeping. Simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available in this webinar. To access this, click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. Following Martin's presentation, Chintan Rabeshia of Arup will moderate the dialogue and audience Q&A. You can pose questions to them using the Q&A tab. If you'd like a copy, Martin's slides can be downloaded from our CLC website after the webinar. Now, I'm very happy to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Martin Van Nieuwkoop. Global Director for Agriculture and Food Global Practice at the World Bank. Martin is speaking to us from Washington, DC, and he leads the formulation and implementation of the World Bank's strategy and knowledge in agriculture and food, oversees the bank's operationalization of the regional and country programs in this area, and manages the agriculture and food global practice. Martin has been with the World Bank since 1993, Prior to this, he was an associate scientist in the economics program of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico, and an associate expert in the Dutch bilateral cooperation program in Pakistan. Without further ado, Mr. Martin Van Nieuwkoop, the mic is yours. There we go. Sorry for that. Um, so thanks again, I mean, for this introduction, I'm very pleased to provide some uh, reflections on this webinar on seeding a food secure future. I think the first remark I want to make is that there's actually quite a sobering message right now. And that is that the world is actually, that the future doesn't, doesn't look very food secure right now. I mean, the world is actually off track to achieve uh, the, the, the second SDG on ending hunger. This was already the case before COVID-19. And what we see that the number of hungry, hungry people in the world has been increasing since 2017. And COVID-19, as you can see, is pushing up these numbers as shown on this slide. Uh, so the situation was already bad and actually COVID-19 is actually making it worse. Uh, also, what you see is that since COVID-19 hit us, local food prices have increased and at a faster rate than overall inflation. Of course, this is hitting the poor very hard because they spent a disproportionate part of their incomes on the purchase of food. And of course, many poor also run the, run the risk actually of losing their sources of income because of COVID-19. Um, there are various ways and pathways on how COVID-19 is affecting food insecurity. I mean, these include income loss, disruptions in supply chains, and local currency depreciations. And also what we see that the effects of COVID-19 are exacerbated by weather extremes and, and, and also the locust outbreak that we see in East Africa and, and, and Middle East uh, right now. Of course, the relevant importance of those, of those pathways vary country by country. Uh, and for that reason, we see a lot of variation in how COVID-19 is ultimately affecting food security across uh, countries. So it's a very diverse picture that we see. Um, of course, COVID-19, is also amplifying, I mean, the um, impacts of food system weaknesses. Um, for instance, uh, agricultures, agricultures encroachment on natural habitats is increasing the risk of zoonotic diseases and unsafe handling of food in production facilities and markets increase the risk of animal to human transmission. So the area expansion and the encroachment of agricultural natural habitats is really amplified and accentuated by COVID-19, increasing the risk of pandemic risk. Um, with 2 billion people being undernourished and, mal and malnourished and 2 billion people being overweight and obese, uh, COVID-19 has also exposed, I mean, the risk of poor diets. I mean, considering the link between compromised immune systems, pre-existing conditions and COVID-19 morbidity. So that's a second. Um, point. And, and a third is that the disruption of food supply chains caused by COVID-19 response measures has further increased the already very high level of food loss and waste in the world. I mean, prior to COVID-19, 
Uh, this was about one third of agricultural production. And of course, of the disruption of the food supply chain, we see that actually increasing. Um, at the same time, what we see is that the broader challenges of the global food system remain. I mean, uh, by 2050, the global food system needs to uh, produce 56% more food, I mean, to feed about 9.8 billion people. With business as usual, that we would mean um, an additional 600 million more hectares under agricultural production, twice the size of India. But that, of course, I mean, will reduce and affect biodiversity, increase the risk of pandemic risk uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in order to be in line with a two degree world, according to the Paris Agreement, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and land use can only be four gigatons by 2050. Right now, they are 12 gigatons. Uh, with business as usual, they will increase to 15 gigatons per year. So clearly you need a huge paradigm shift there as well. I mean, this re represents a kind of a mounting challenge uh, ahead of the global food system. Now, this is a somewhat sobering picture that I'm depicting here. Um, but of course, there's also some good news. Um, and the good news is that we know what needs to be done actually to, um, to put food systems on a more healthy, resilient and sustainable footing. And the, the growing better report of the, of the Food and Land Use Commission that came out last year and to which the uh, World Bank also was a contributor, I mean, lays out, I mean, the 10 critical transitions to transform food systems that, that are listed here, you know, on the, uh, on the slide. Uh, they, they cover both the supply side and the demand side of the global food uh, systems. Um, the good news here is also that if those transitions are being made, there is a huge economic dividend to be captured by 2030 to the tune of about $5.7 trillion. The investments, the needed investments between now and 2030 to make those 10 critical transitions happen is about 300 to $350 billion per year. So we, so we know, the good news is we know what needs to be done. Now, what does this all mean for the urban populations in the world? This is a bit the focus of this webinar. Um, just as a reminder, uh, right now, 4.4 billion people live in, uh, of the world's population, I mean, uh, already live in urban areas. Uh, this is expected to grow to 6.7 billion by 2050, or more than a 50% increase over the next 30 years. I mean, this is a massive, uh, massive change. Um, of course, many of the world's urban population live in cities in Asia, um, and, and those cities, as we know, I mean, face many food challenges and food opportunities, as indicated on this slide. Uh, but in a nutshell, I mean, these challenges and opportunities highlight that urban Asia is a leading hotspot for larger global food si system issues, and at the center of massive future opportunities for farms, firms, and governments were affecting the, these challenges. So there are challenges, but at the same time, there are also huge, we also see huge opportunities here. Um, the question is whether cities in Asia are ready. I mean, the World Bank recently completed and we'll be launching soon a report that will provide guidance and suggestions on how cities can best address these challenges and capture these uh, opportunities. Uh, the title of the report is Recipe for Progress. Um, advancing the urban food agenda in emerging Asia. And it makes the case uh, for food systems that are reliable, inclusive, competitive, and healthy. In other words, it actually it makes the case for rich uh, food systems. As I said, you know, we are in the final stages, stages of uh, finalizing this uh, report and we'll be launching this uh, very soon. So this is kind of a preview that I'm presenting. Um, what the report notes is that some cities are more engaged on urban food systems than others. Um, nearly three quarters of Asian cities are at an early stage in the development and implementation of forward-looking, integrated and inclusive food policies and programs, which we call Food Smart. Uh, among the small cities, let's say cities uh, with less than 200,000 uh, people, Nearly 90% are at an early stage, uh, either reactive or, or somewhat engaged. And a higher proportion of large, I mean, um, larger than 1 million people, a population, and very large, larger than 5 million, 
are more advanced on this agenda, uh, although there is enormous diversity amongst the cities, and most, including most capitals, uh, most capital cities still have much work to do. Of course, uh, Singapore is recognized as one of the uh, cities that is leading this uh, agenda, uh, not only in Asia, but uh, actually across uh, the world. So we are in a good location for this webinar today, I would say. Um, what more can cities do? Um, the report identifies four areas where cities could potentially play an important role, and they're listed here on the slides. Uh, the first is urban food system governance. Um, the second area is food consumption. The third area is food logistics and marketing. And the fourth area is urban and peri-urban food production. Um, the report argues, uh, because the question is, you know, should, should this be a kind of an agenda for the Ministry of Agriculture? And why should this be an agenda for the cities and, and city governments? Uh, the report argues that cities have a comparative advantage to act in this space although this is not always recognized. I mean, cities can be more nimble than central ministries in terms of coordinating multi-sectoral interventions and experimenting with user-centered interventions, because clearly this is a multi-sectoral agenda. It doesn't sit with one single ministry. Uh, and for that reason, it's difficult actually to uh, manage and guide this agenda from a single ministry. And for that reason, cities are much better positioned actually to take on, I mean, the urban food challenges um, uh, the report also points out that one size doesn't fit all. I mean, local circumstances influence what is feasible to do. Cities, so cities who want to engage on this agenda will need to do so very actively. I mean, this is not a story of uh, cut and paste and copy. I mean, cities need to engage actively. They can learn from each other. But they, in the end, they, they have to kind of um, uh, develop and, and, and design, I mean, their own path, uh, what they can do most effectively in this space. Um, the report argues that cities need to be proactive and mainstream food matters in urban governments. I mean, think about zoning and land use planning, transport planning and infrastructure investments, approaches to urban waste management. I mean, this kind of reflects the multi-sectoral nature of this um, uh, agenda. And if those decisions are not factored in early, um, cities might be locked in into situations in which they don't want to be... Um, you know, with, in, with unintended and long-term negative consequences for consumers and, 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 and food operators. Once the infrastructure is in place, it is actually difficult to change it. So be proactive and be upfront is, a, is an important measure, it's, I mean, for cities if they want to kind of be serious on urban food system governance. Um, urban food consumption, um, the report puts forward that cities in Asia have significant opportunities to influence consumers' food choice and promote healthy diets. I mean, for people, the local economy and the, and the environment. Um, this is of course, I mean, very important to what I said earlier. I mean, uh, factoring in the huge increase in the urban population that we see. Uh, a lot of this is driven by migration, urbanization. Uh, lots of people's diets are in flux. They need to make um, uh, new choices and, um, you know, and governments can actually play a role that they make the right choices. So what can governments exactly do? Um, they can prevent the rise in diet-related non-communicable diseases to consumer education, considering considerations for taxing unhealthy foods. And when there is public procurement of food, such as for hospitals and school-for-school -school lunches, uh, ensuring it is healthy food. Ensuring access by vulnerable people to healthy food, to safety net programs, such as ensuring equality in school feeding, food banks, and soup kitchens. And then also an important area is reducing and managing food waste through preventive measures, discouraging waste by consumers, such as fees for household waste collection, and encouraging secondary food use, such as food banks, composting, and the bioeconomy. So an important agenda for uh, urban city governments here. Um, the third area uh, is food logistics and, and marketing. Um, uh, this is an important agenda uh, for cities to engage on, uh, particularly when it comes to the informal food sector, because, you know, right now what we see in many cities is an, in, a very active informal uh, food sector. And in this respect, I mean, the report lays out a number of best practices approaches, as indicated on the slide, that, that cities could consider uh, food market upgrades, 
um, rising, you know, increasing the standards. I mean, for the informal sector players, players work with them, do not replace them, etc. So an important area here as well. Um, the report also presents several entry points that cities can play in encouraging urban uh, and peri-urban food production. Uh, these entry points relate to urban planning and zoning, uh, fiscal measures, as well as dedicated measures to increase, I mean, the, the, the value of, uh, of farming. Of course, also here, uh, technology developments uh, will also determine what urban cities and urban city governments can do on urban and peri-urban food production. I mean, think about vertical farming, um, you know, hydroponics, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that didn't exist, of course, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And to the extent, I mean, that, it, that, that those technologies will evolve, they will also actually expand, I mean, the possibilities, I mean, that uh, city governments have, I mean, to kind of stimulate and promote, I mean, those type of production uh, methodologies. Uh, so, so, so it's a very dynamic, I mean, this is a very dynamic field. And, uh, and I think city governments, I mean, need to keep a close eye on the frontier of this technology so that they actually can make sure that what they pursue, I mean, uh, you know, reflects, I mean, the, the technical possibilities that are becoming um, uh, available. I, I think this is a very exciting um, uh, area. Um, as I said, I mean, this is very, the report argues that this is a very multi-sectoral, um, a very multi-sectoral um, agenda. Um, so a key message of the report is that getting it right requires the active involvement of multiple actors on the urban food agenda, from city planners, national ministries, food producers and distributors, food companies, consumers, uh, and international development partners, um, also NGOs, uh, CSOs. I mean, all those actors can play a positive role in promoting reliable, inclusive, competitive, and healthy urban food systems. Um, the soon, in our publication that, that will be released soon, as I said, uh, outlines in more, in more detail the roles and responsibilities of each actor in this, uh, in this, in this space. But I think the important message here is that, you know, this is an important agenda for city governments, uh, but city governments can also not do it alone. And, and there's a kind of a, a wide uh, spectrum of stakeholders that need to be engaged in making sure that this is being done uh, right. Um, of course, one of these actors um, that can play a role in the call for action, as I said in the previous slides, are international uh, development partners. Um, and, um, you know, and as such, I mean, the World Bank is, is very keen uh, to engage on this agenda um, of urban urban food and, and urban agriculture. Uh, the fact that we did this report is a reflection uh, of that. Uh, it also fits, I mean, very much, I mean, um, our focus on, um, on global food systems. I mean, we actually changed the name of the agriculture global practice to agriculture and food global practice. I mean, to reflect, you know, our engagement on food systems, I mean, with the aim to simultaneously create conditions, I mean, for a healthy people, healthy planet and a healthy um, economy by providing financial and technical um, as assistance. Uh, our portfolio is about $20 billion in agriculture and food uh, projects. And we provide about financing of three to $4 billion a year in new uh, um, financing for agriculture uh, and food working closely with governments and, and, and the private sector. As I said, I mean, uh, urban agriculture is also a frontier issue for the World Bank. Uh, with this report that's coming out, um, a, a, a recipe for success, um, a recipe for progress, um, this is our first step, you know, into this agenda. Uh, and we're looking forward, I mean, following the laws of this report, actually to work with city governments across Asia and across the world who are interested actually to move this agenda forward and also help them for those who are interested to implement this uh, successfully. I think with that, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much and I hand it back to uh, Dinesh. Thank you, Martin, for a wonderfully clear overview of the food challenges facing us, uh, the multi-sectoral challenges and opportunities for cities, and a very clear and compelling call for cities to move towards rich 
or reliable, inclusive, competitive, and healthy food systems. Let me now welcome and introduce our guest moderator today, Chintan Raveshia. Chintan is a trained architect and urban designer, and he leads the city's planning and design team for Arup in Southeast Asia. He has over 16 years experience living across three continents and his projects in Southeast Asia range from planning the new capital city for Indonesia to developing a vision for the future of smart HDBs in Singapore. Under Arup Singapore's Future Cities Hub, his research projects focus on the future of food manufacturing, which he currently works with CLC on, walkability and autonomous vehicles in cities. Chintan is also an active WCS Young Leader and leads the uh, WCS Young Leaders webinar series. So we're very happy to have him in a different role with us today. Without further ado, Chintan, the mic is yours. Thanks, Dinesh, and a uh, very nice introduction. So that really helps. Uh, I think we all had uh, a poll to look into, isn't it? Some people actually use LinkedIn, but also some people had to put a poll to get, uh, answer some a question when you all joined this call. So can we actually have a look at the poll, what the results are? That's brilliant, isn't it? 84% have said invest in urban farming. And that's a very interesting point because uh, there's a lot happening in, around thinking about what cities can do in terms of urban, urban areas can do in terms of farming. But also it's great to see that there's a lot of conversation around community gardening. Um, there's been uh, thoughts about how communities and urban aspects come together. So that's really nice. Uh, close to one third of the people say that cities will always be vulnerable to food shortages. Uh, let's hope that's not the case. Uh, but I think we have certain questions for Martin. So we're going to uh, let him answer those one of those questions. So Martin, really, really great presentation. And um, we have we had we received quite a few questions from people uh, even before this event started. Uh, but of course, I get a choice as a moderator to start with my own. So let me start with my first question and then we move on to the rest. Um, a very controversial question maybe for the rest of the world. Will the world be a better place if you all turn vegetarian? Thanks, uh, Shitan, and this is indeed an excellent uh, question. Um, you know, I said that, you know, we, in our engagement uh, on, on food systems, we focus on healthy people, healthy planet, and healthy economy. Um, of course, you know, for healthy people having a healthy diet, I mean, means, you know, a very diversified diet. I mean, proteins, carbohydrates, micronutrients. Um, uh, so it, it implies, I mean, the, the importance for having, you know, a diet that, con you know, consisting of di diversified food. And um, so whether you're a vegetarian or whether you're not a vegetarian, uh, a, div a, a, div a, div a diversified diet, I think, uh, with balanced nutritional composition, is, is what, uh, what critical. Now, you know, and I'm also wondering, you know, so if, if our ultimate aim is to make sure that, you know, all people in the world have a healthy diet, uh, whether the optimizing function is a binary choice between vegetarian and non-vegetarian. I'm not sure whether that is the optimizing function. Now, having said that, um, I do agree that the food that people eat, I mean, should reflect, I mean, the economic cost of producing it. And we know that some of the food that we eat, uh, particularly meat, of course, I mean, doesn't reflect, I mean, all the environmental costs. I mean, think for instance on the carbon emissions associated with meat production. And here, here I go to the healthy planet, you know, side of what you engage on. So, so I do believe that governments and regulators or, or the market somehow, and of course there's also something you're working on, needs to make sure, I mean, that the price of food, I mean, reflect their true costs. And that then will allow consumers, I mean, to make the choices, you know, uh, that are basically best for them. Uh, and hopefully, of course, governments will, um, you know, uh, educate, I mean, also those uh, consumers about uh, the trade-off between those possible choices. Thanks for that. I think that really helps to rethink for all of us. I mean, just a small anecdote, I turned vegetarian in November because I was thinking if I'm selling the rest of the world zero carbon cities, I can't be having meat. So 
it's, it, 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 it's actually very interesting. So, you know, my son, you know, who is 18, has, has a girlfriend who is vegan, you know, and she came with us on vacation. And I was a chef, so I had to cook actually for two <laughs> vegan food. And actually, it was great. <laughs> so I had nothing personally, nothing against it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, and this is, again, uh, as Dinesh was talking about, I mean, we are working on right now the, the, the new capital city for Indonesia. And these are the questions that come up for cities which are not there yet. And they're going to come in the post-COVID world probably the, one of the first cities to come in the post-COVID world. So what would be your most important recommendation for new cities that spring up, especially in Asia, in the context of food security? So let me tell a story here. You know, I was, um, you know, I had a management team meeting a few years ago in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, of course, we all know that the security situation in Dhaka, you know, is, um, is kind of tricky. So. So before we started the meeting, you know, from the bank's office in Dhaka, there was a presentation by our security um, colleague um, to tell us what to do, you know, in the city. So there was a whole long list of what to do and what not to do. But at some point, you know, he put up a slide of a wet market, you know, selling meat and vegetables. And he told us, don't go there, it's not safe. Um, so, you know, I, I think that captures a very important story. You know, I think there's a very important role for city governments, I mean, to ensure, I mean, that the food that's being sold, you know, in the cities is actually safe, I mean, for consumers to eat. I mean, we did a report a few years ago, I mean, calculating the health cost um, associated with unsafe food, you know, and those numbers are of course staggering uh, and of course, I mean, this notion of making sure that food is safe is, is again, accentuated also by the COVID-19 uh, crisis, where there's a lot of talk about, you know, the role that wet markets play in the transmission from animals, I mean, to humans of zoonotic uh, diseases. Uh, so in light of COVID-19, I mean, that would be my first advice to, um, um, to city governments, I mean, to make sure that actually that the food that's being sold in the cities actually uh, is safe. Then uh, the second is, you know, with this huge increase in urban population that we see uh, right now and with the uh, enormous projection till 2050, what I said earlier also in the presentation, the diet, you know, the people moving from rural areas into cities, I mean, their diets are in flux. I mean, they need to make new choices. And the question is, I mean, do they go for the cheap calorie rich, I mean, uh, fast food, or do they make the healthy choices? And I think here, governments also have a very important role to play actually to, to educate, I mean, um, uh, their populations. Uh, related to that, uh, I think that um, governments have a very important role to play to kind of work with future generations when it comes to school meals. Um, I think governments, city governments have a direct influence there on how to influence, I mean, the, uh, the food choices that the future generation uh, will make. And then finally, uh, Shintan, I also think that, um, you know, we need to look in, you know, into the role of the private sector, I mean, very seriously. I mean, uh, to what extent, I mean, should uh, food marketing, you know, help to, up, you know, to certain standards when it comes to promoting healthy food and should be discouraged, I mean, to promote, you know, kind of uh, extremely processed, sugary, fatty, unhealthy foods. I, I think governments also have a role to play uh, there. So again, I, I think uh, no doubt, I mean, there's a, you know, this is a very important area for cities to engage on in. Uh, most cities are not there yet. Uh, and of course, it's a very wide uh, agenda. So in that sense, you know, I think it's also important that cities can learn from each other. And that actually that there would be kind of, you know, uh, organizations who have the expertise actually to provide the technical assistance and maybe the financial assistance, I mean, to cities to engage on this agenda. Thanks for that, Martin. I think let's go to some of the questions that people had asked um, before they joined. And I think let's, what's the next question? I think it's, uh, can we have the next question on the thing, which is, yeah, this is an interesting one. I think this is, and I think you kind of touched upon that. Um, and this is where can, and in a way, let me add a bit more to that. Do you think we can add, create food as a catalyst 
to achieve the optimization of key resources? Uh, can that become a circular circularization of the things? How do you combine the optimization of these things in open source? Uh, I think that food can definitely be part of a urban circular um, economy now. Um, I mean, think about, I mean, the, um, and I'm not even going to production right now, but you know, think about, I mean, all the organic waste, I mean, that is produced in cities, you know, how can that be, you know, transformed process into organic fertilizers, uh, uh, for instance? Um, you know, or, you know, to what extent could that be um, uh, transformed into um, renewable energy biogas systems? Uh, I think there's an opportunity there as well. Now, then all the um, recycled wastewater, um, you know, I think that presents uh, a very good opportunity. I mean, maybe for urban agriculture and urban food production. I mean, uh, uh, think about, you know, I mean, uh, um, I mean, the irrigation systems that you need actually to produce high value agriculture. I mean, use of recycled wastewater can also be so. So I, I don't think that the food, se food sector is the solution, I mean, to the circular economy, but I think it should be, you know, if cities are thinking about moving in that, in that direction, I think food can, you know, can be an important um, uh, dimension uh, of it. And, and by doing so, you know, uh, everybody has to eat three times a day. So it, it becomes also very personal actually to get, get people involved, I mean, in, this, in the circular economy. So in that sense, uh, in response to your, your, your question, Sintan, whether, that's could, whether this could be a catalyst, you know, food um, and food in the context of the circular economy I mean, would drive, I mean, the circular economy, you know, into people's homes, I would say. And in that sense, I think it could be a catalyst or at least one of the catalysts. Okay. Uh, that's th it's amazing to see so many questions and I'm, tr I'm going through all of them and trying to see which one to ask. But there is probably one around climate change that was asked uh, before this presentation started. And let's get to that and then we get to the questions from, or from the floor. So can we have a question on, the, on climate change next? How is climate change affecting the food production globally? I think it has to be a link that brings it all together. Um, the thing is, you know, if you go out, and I do that myself um, all the time, and if you, if you ask farmers, you know, where the climate change is affecting food production, I mean, no surprise, actually, most farmers, you know, will, um, um, response, um, you know, in, uh, affirmative, in an affirmative way. And what they are talking about is that you see more frequent adverse events. I mean, drought shocks, you know, floods, etc. You also see more unpredictable weather. Uh, so it actually becomes more difficult to plan. Uh, and also you see that when you listen to farmers, um, that uh, warming weather is also facilitating the growth of pests and transmission of diseases. Uh, I mean, think about the locust infestation, the locust infestation in, in, in Africa. I mean, th think about the full army worm. I mean, that is actually taking over the world. Um, also a reflection of that. So this means that we need to invest um, in research and development. I mean, to come up with adaptive technologies to build resilience uh, and actually mainstream what we say climate smart agriculture that actually aims to unlock the triple win of uh, increasing productivity, improving adaptation, while contributing to mitigation in a kind of a simultaneous fashion. And the analysis that we've done actually shows that there are many opportunities, um, I mean, for unlocking the triple win. Okay, that is, that is helpful. Uh, thanks for the answer. Uh, Let's get onto the floor now because it seems there's so many interesting questions. Let's take the top one from Kenneth. Yeah, it's 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 such an interesting question because I mean I go through that even when we are doing the research out here. When we think urban farming, and at least in Singapore, but I would say everywhere, the first image that comes to mind is growing food crops, 
um, and in Singapore, especially for people who don't know, HDBs are the housing development uh, buildings, uh, but frankly, any buildings um, and, and on the rooftops and all at the fringes of our island state. Um, what other possibilities for urban farming are there? And let's go beyond Singapore um, in terms of ur urbanity and food coming together. No, I mean, you know, I also mentioned that in my in my presentation. I mean, I mean, those opportunities in urban farming, rooftop farming, hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, you know, this is all made possible because of technology development. I mean, those opportunities didn't exist, you know, um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so, so. Uh, if you project, if you project, I mean, those te technology development, you know, and if you then look at the interest of people, uh, it, it seems like that people in urban areas are actually are really interested in. It. They want to take it up, you know, and so there's a market for it. Uh, so, um, so, so I think, you know, uh, if you look what has happened over the last 10, 15 years, uh, if you project it at the same pace forward, I mean, the possibilities are of course uh, endless. I would say, and it's you know. It's a lot of fun, um, and uh, I could also see that uh, in a context of COVID-19, and if social distancing, you know, is something that uh, we will need to live with for a long time. I mean, uh, urban farming, backyard farming, rooftop farming, you know, becomes even more attractive because it's actually a, quite a rewarding, uh, socially distanced uh, activity uh, now. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, cities should get at their hopes up too high that, uh, you know, vertical farming, you know, um, will make cities uh, food self-sufficient. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, the, the, the urban population will, 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 will grow by more than, more than 50%, I mean, to 6.8 billion people in, uh, in 2050. So it is, it is I don't think it's, it's uh, um, um, reasonable to expect, I mean, the cities will be self-sufficient. So, but, you know, it could contribute, I mean, uh, uh, to it. Uh, you know, what I think um, is also very interesting, and this also fits very well in this whole notion of seeking improved resilience uh, after COVID-19, uh, with COVID-19 showing that uh, international and global food supply chains are uh, vulnerable to disruptions. Uh, so there's really a quest, I mean, for building resilience. Uh, I th so making making those uh, supply chains shorter. So in that sense, I also see a lot of potential in community supported agriculture where urban population, I mean, have a kind of a contract, I mean, with farms and farmers uh, in the perif periphery of, of the cities. Um, I see also a lot of um, future in that, uh, in that um, uh, possibility. And that also then, you know, links the urban consumers and the rural producers, the urban dwellers with the rural, rural neighbors, which I think also is a good uh, thing. It will reinforce, I mean, the local economy. So I think that would also be an important part of the equation. I think when cities think about, I mean, food self-sufficiency, if they're thinking along those lines. Uh, that's a good point because the next question is basically carry forwarding from this question around, when we think about urban farming, we think about green food growing somewhere and but we need to think about more than other what about everything else that we eat uh, Singapore had this interesting thing that the one thing that Singapore needs if it ever has a massive lockdown and in a way funny enough you're experiencing is rice beef and pork now that's impossible to provide in a city uh, all all produced here so question for us will global supply chains of food collapse and do we need new sustainable sources of food and probably the more the second part of the question is more important, uh, which is going beyond the greens that we always take photographs of when we think about urban farming. So, um, in my answer to the first part of the question is no. I, I don't think that um, uh, global supply chains for food will will collapse. Um, it's interesting, um, Chintan. I mean, what you saw uh, if you look at the food price crisis in two thousand eight. Um, what happened then uh, was that many exporting, uh, rice exporting countries actually imposed export bans, uh, which actually did a lot of harm. I mean, about 30 to 40% of the increase in the price of rice and the price of wheat uh, at that time was attributed 
I mean, to those export uh, restrictions. If you look at COVID-19, and I think people learned from that, and of course, we at the World Bank helped our clients learn from that. Uh, if you look what happened you know, after COVID-19, there has been really a restraint in countries, I mean, in imposing those export restrictions. I mean, we don't see them to the extent that, 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 that we saw them um, um, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, that's one. Of course, I mean, uh, global supply chains need to adjust. I mean, I fully agree to that. I, I don't think they will collapse, but they will, need, they will need to adjust. And, you know, I was touching on that uh, in my answer to the previous question. You know, they need to become more resilient. And becoming more resilient, it means that they need to become more local. Uh, I already mentioned that dimension, but they also need to become more digital. I mean, actually, with the ability to kind of connect consumers and producers in, um, in real time. And then the final uh, reflection on um, insect, uh, uh, plant-based protein and insect-based protein. Um, I think that's a very exciting area as well. Uh, it provides more consumer choice. It will help the global food system meeting its challenge to produce 56% more food. Um, so, um, and of course, you know, insect-based uh, uh, protein actually has a role in, in very in a lot of you know societies and, and cultures so in that sense it's not something totally new of course also insect based protein can be a very important source of uh, animal feed and that might also kind of you know be an important dimension in the discussion that's going on on livestock and, and meat uh, so uh, but yeah um, I, I'm looking also with great interest I mean the uh, developments in plant-based uh, and uh, insect-based proteins. Back to you, Sintan. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I, there are such amazing questions still there, and it's so nice to see there's really activity happening within the question thing. But unfortunately, uh, we've got, we got to stop somewhere. So here's where we have to end, Martin. I'm going to pass it back on to Dinesh. But thank you so much for answering all the questions. And, and, and the presentation was great. Uh, Dinesh, back to you. Thank you, uh, Chintan, and thank you, Martin, for a very lively and interesting conversation covering everything from uh, green leafy vegetables to insects. I was kind of sure we would hear about cow uh, farts at some point because that seems to turn up at a lot of these food uh, webinars, but we didn't. That's all right. Thank you, gentlemen, and um, uh, for being with us today. Now, we'll be taking a short break after this webinar from our two, usual two weekly cycle. And our next webinar will be in a month on the 8th of October. It's organized with Connected Places Catapult in the UK, and it's titled Glasgow Leading the UK's Net Zero Carbon Agenda. Greg Clark, Chairman of Connected Places Catapult, and Susan Aitken, the leader of the Glasgow City Council, We'll have a fireside chat on climate change and how Glasgow is decarbonizing its infrastructure. Please register to attend using the QR code or the link. This webinar has been live streamed on CLC's Facebook page and we'll upload a recording of it within the next 24 hours on our CLC YouTube channel, where you can find almost 600 other videos, including several related to the topic of food security. Finally, thank you to you, dear viewers, for your participation. Before you leave, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form. Do tell us what you enjoyed or how we can do better. We've come to the end of today's webinar, but we will be leaving this room open for another 10 minutes. Feel free to exchange comments with each other and perhaps the uh, panelists, if they decide to stay a little bit more, uh, using the chat box. Until our next webinar on the 8th of October, goodbye and stay healthy.